from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. My name is Nora Krug, and I am the, uh, I write the paperbacks column for the Washington Post, um, a charter sponsor of this event. Um, and I just am here to introduce Caliph Brown. Um, in his whimsical world, uh, mosquitoes wear tuxedos and waffles run away and people raise fleas to make money and grandmas play the electric guitar. Um, his imaginative wordplay and illustrations has, have been described as meaningfully eccentric and quirky, um, but he prefers to call his work uh, nonsensical and offbeat, um, but they are certainly colorful and provocative in the best way. Um, they spark your imagination and offer new ways to look at the familiar. Um, his books include the bestseller Flamingos on the Roof, Soup for Breakfast, and Dutch Sneakers and Flea Keepers. His latest book is Boy Wonders, which features a boy who wonders. Um, but his questions, as you might expect, are not at all what you'd expect. Um, he asks, do bees get hives? Are phones annoyed if no one calls? <laughs> Do clouds get jealous during storms and steal each other's thunder? I, I hope maybe he's going to be able to answer some of those <laughs> questions today. Um, like many children's authors, he has a child, but he started writing and illustrating long before that. Um, his first book, Pokebats and Octopus Slacks, was published in 1998, and he now lives in Maine with his family. Um, where he's working on several other books and um, enjoys soup for breakfast. <laughs> he tells me that he likes mushroom barley. So <laughs> anyway, he, he'll tell you some more about himself and do some drawing for you. So here is Caleb Brown. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nora. Um, thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm so happy to be here. Uh, a celebration of books, of language, of um, reading is, is heaven, um, and it's uh, knock on wood, not raining. Um, I should tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I had a kind of an unusual childhood. I grew up in a tree fort in Shreveport, Louisiana, a breezy cabana with one of those fantastic lawns, the kind with gnomes and plastic swans, plywood signs and fiberglass fawns. I was a weaselly child, easily riled and wildly erratic, known for my dramatic tin drum tantrums, the loudest kind. My parents didn't seem to mind. They were more inclined to read books and be quiet. So I decided to try it. We had a lot of fun. We spent every Christmas with my beloved grandpa on the Isthmus of Panama. We called him Old Banana Paw and Monkey McGee, so partial was he to that ubiquitous fruit. Clever, handsome, and meticulous to boot, he wore a ridiculous suit during the spring equinox with a rhinestone ring and sequin socks. My other grandpa, over in London town, was also fun to be around. His numerous pets were his main claim to fame. And except for the shrew, they were all pretty tame. I played this silly game with his parrot, whom I would politely offer a packet of suet. He wanted to chew it, but never could do it. Instead of the suet, I'd give him some millet. He'd ruffle his feathers and purposely spill it. Instead of the millet, I gave him a pellet. He'd narrow his eyes and would not even smell it. This food, said the parrot, if that's what you call it, is very unpleasant, so open your wallet and kindly provide me with 10 pounds in cash. I'm off to the village for bangers and mash. Now, where were we? Ah, yes, over in London. Well, I was very fond of life across the pond in the UK. Available jobs were very low pay, but I jumped in the fray and decided to stay a while. What can I say? I'm an Anglophile. 
I worked as a whistleblower for a local thistle grower, keeping weasels and possums from stealing thistle blossoms. I also drove the daily beetle shuttle. My route was Liverpool to Kidney Puddle. I delivered limes to Lemonster and news to Coal Castle, but the whole hassle of paying my dues and the winter blues propelled me back stateside, and with great pride, I moved to Atlanta to raise manta rays and champion scorpions. Now, despite being stung on the tongue and the nose, I kept my poise and won five best in shows. Now, you're probably thinking to yourself that this person is a little bit odd. And I admit, my behavior is, I admit, a bit strange. I'll give you some examples. I like to show crayfish crochet samples. I sometimes sell sandpaper to sandpipers, and I just invented plant stand diapers for people who overwater. <laughs> my beloved alma mater is the college at Endover. There on my own, I was mainly known for falling head over tea kettle. I would pause, let the debris settle, then sing a song about the space shuttle and my days as an astronaut. It went by fast, and mostly I just gasped a lot. <gasps> First from the incredible view, <gasps> then from the taste of that inedible goo. They made me eat this tube in a food, food in a tube that had already been chewed. Dude. <laughs> then I got in a feud with another astronaut over which of us got the best elastic cot for sleeping. I'm such a cheapskate, my keepsakes are barely worth keeping. My spats, my slide rule, my toad-shaped commode stool. I'm totally old school, nouveau riche, stuck in the drive through Can't find my car quiche. <laughs> my new niche, since my marching band disbanded, is teaching tennis, two-handed, a racket in each, to a guy named Dennis from Venice Beach, who loves to preach but never practices. I was once attacked by cactuses, so I'm careful to a fault. I keep my fishing pole in a pole vault. I never fold felt or spill salt. And I don't often don a caftan or a shawl, very seldom, if at all. Same goes for a cape or a cloak, just a regular bloke, not too macho, not much of a honcho. I will in a pinch, though, wear a poncho with a couple bandoleros. I load them with breadsticks to feed the sparrows. I'm a fly in the kitchen at home on the range. My behavior is, I admit, a, a bit strange. Now, where was I? One thing that isn't strange and doesn't change is my daily routine. Every day at 6.15, I walk in Morocco, I stroll in Kowloon, I jog in Chicago, I run in Rangoon, I dance in Gdansk, and I swim in Cologne, I breathe the sea air in Sierra Leone, then I come home and write a poem, usually about a gnome. For instance, Lou Gnome. Hey, look who came back home to Hoboken, it's Lou Gnome. Like the G in his name, Lou is silent, completely non-violent. He doesn't speak, even when spoken to. None of the gnomes in Hoboken do. <laughs> now, that's the kind of thing that makes me, gets my mind going. 
why are the, why are the gnomes in Hoboken so soft-spoken? And for, that brings up other questions about elves. Like, is there a store where elves buy elves wear? Do they behave themselves there? If the shelves are bare, can they find elves wear elsewhere? That's kind of what happens in my book, Boy Wonders. Uh, things occur to this little boy who is very much like myself. I am I'm often perplexed, completely vexed. I have a lot of questions and queries and, and odd theories. For instance, do bees get hives? Do onions cry? Is pepper apt to sneeze? Do paper plates and two by fours remember being trees? Are phones annoyed if no one calls? Do ants, when anxious, climb the walls? Is water scared of waterfalls? Don't you ever wonder if clouds get jealous during storms and steal each other's thunder? Do taffy pullers ever push and make a glob of sticky mush? Do sleepwalking lumberjacks hunger for slumber snacks, stacks of flapjacks, perhaps? Now, as I, as I go on, some other questions may occur to me, and I may interrupt myself, so I'll, I'll, that's a fair warning. Now, as you may, as you may probably know, I, I, I love language. I love words. I love listening to people speak. I love the music of language. And I try to find inspiration in everyday life and, and, and life all around me. Um, one, of the, one of the first places I, I look for information is my family. I'll give you a good example of that. Now this is my grandpa, and my grandpa has nose hair. It really grows there. It grows and grows and grows, so much so that people suppose that grandpa must have a mustache since he waxes it, so it cracks a bit when he laughs. It also makes him snore, but my grandma doesn't care. She can't hear too much ear hair. This is my distant cousin, Ed, with cherries on his head. He says I like the color, so all his stuff is red. Last week he had a fever. His head was very warm. Ed smelled like cherry marmalade, and flies began to swarm. Ah, thank you. Now, one of my other main inspirations that pops up in almost all my books is food. I love writing about food. I love talking about food. It's something that everybody can identify. Everybody has their favorites. Everybody has food that they don't like. Myself, I'm disgusted by custard. I've never discussed it. And pudding is creepy. I don't really trust it. And I also, as Nora mentioned in their introduction, love soup for breakfast. People don't expect this, but that's the way I am. Not a fan of toast and jam, or griddle cakes with eggs and ham, or even cream of wheat, a bowl of cream of broccoli. Now there's a morning treat. 
Coffee drinkers often scoff, but I just laugh and sip my broth. That's the way my day starts off. I hope you will respect this. I like soup for breakfast. Now, another, another poem that was inspired by the mundane, the everyday, was I was at the supermarket, and I was walking down the gauntlet of frozen food uh, cases past the ice cream section, and I swore that I saw a carton that said alphabet sherbet. And in that split second, before I looked more closely, I'd already pictured it in my mind, what it might taste like, with little frozen letters of different flavors embedded in it. And I thought, that sounds totally awesome. And then when I looked closer, it said assorted sherbet or apricot sherbet or something. I was very disappointed. But I thought, well, I, at least I can write a poem about it. So I, I have a poem called Alphabet Sherbet. Have you ever heard of it? I bought myself a gallon and ate about a third of it. The A's are all amazing. The B's are a beautiful blue. The C's and D's are cool and delicious. The E's are enjoyable, too. The F's are fair, but don't you fret. The G's are great. So go and get a bowl of alphabet sherbet. You'll love it. I'm sure of it. Now, I, have, I have actually have, have a lot of other culinary peculiarities. For instance, whenever I go to the car wash, I always bring along a bowl of goulash to keep me warm. I pretend I'm lost at sea in a soapy storm, and things are getting wavy aboard my Royal Navy boat. So I remove the gravy from the Royal Gravy boat and store it safely in a soup tureen equipped with a lid. Then I add scallops wrapped in squid, a favorite recipe of Captain Kidd, by the way. Um, what else? I'm so afraid of becoming one of those horrible orange tan fellows that I stopped eating carrots and canned tangellos. Now, eating goulash in a car wash could be construed as fast food. And I have to admit that I sometimes eat on the run, which sounds like fun, but it's actually very dangerous. Muy peligroso. And this is how I know so. Last summer, while riding my bicycle eating falafel, I somehow fell off on my head. It really felt awful. I lost my falafel. That was the first thing I said. My mother was tearful. She gave me an earful and offered a waffle instead. I still love falafel, but now I'm more careful. I eat it at home in my bed. And lastly, uh, concerning food, I'm very excited because I just uh, opened a cheese shop, which has a beautiful mozzarella trellis. The neighbors won't admit it, but I know they're very jealous. And I decided to also try to build a beautiful Gouda gazebo with a red wax roof, which is both beautiful and waterproof. Um, I also uh, for briefly owned a, a biscotti shop. And this is what I do. I practice my karate chop and snap a few in two. Now, this is another example of finding a, a poem in, the, in the, my everyday life. 
I lived in a house in Los Angeles. Uh, I was renting a house, and the backyard had these beautiful elephant ear plants, these wonderful, huge plants. And I'd sit outside sometimes, and I started to notice that snails were starting to eat the plants, nibbling away. And I'd sit out there and watch them, and they were making pretty good progress on, on eating a couple of these beautiful big leaves. And my landlord had come by and noticed this um, and told me, well, we're going to come in. I'm going to have the, the gardener come in, and we'll kill those snails, right? You know, we'll, we'll get rid of the snails for you. And uh, after sort of like watching them for a while, their progress, and sitting out and observing them, I kind of had gotten a little bit attached to them. And uh, I started to think about how the word pest and the word pet are so similar. I told them not to, not, please don't kill the snails. I'm kind of getting to like them. And I had to end up pay for the plants. But uh, they just eventually devoured most of the plants in the backyard. But I sort of had felt I'd, I'd become attached to them. So um, this poem is kind of a recreation of that experience. It never fails, those pesky snails are always in the pudding. Lousy guess, those nasty pests, they're always up to something. I've tried like mad to find their nest, but snails are smart, I must confess. The trails they leave can fool the best, and snails are good at hiding. Oh well, at least they don't make threats, they don't eat meat, they don't place bets. They almost always pay their debts and never puff on cigarettes. I think I'll keep those snails as pets and feed them lots of pudding. Now, that poem called Snails is in my, was in my first book called Polka Bats and Octopus Slacks. And when I sign that book, I usually do a little drawing of a snail. I've done so for years. And to sort of keep from getting bored, I started to elaborate on these little snail drawings in the book. And so a regular snail, somewhat regular snail, would become Maybe an alligator snail. <laughs> Perhaps a cat snail. And I really love seeing the way the kids reacted to, to these combination creatures. And I started to think about when I was a kid, I loved Greek mythology, all the creatures of Greek mythology. Especially, I think my favorite was a griffin, combination of, you kids probably know, an eagle and a lion. Uh, the sphinx, combination of a lion and a person with a person's head. Um, I illustrated a book called Greece Rome Monsters, uh, published by the Getty Museum. And I got to do my versions of all these fantastic creatures, including the Minotaur, uh, the Manticore, the Basilisk, all these fantastic creatures that I've loved since childhood. I got to do my own kind of colorful versions of them. And uh, the one that I was most frightened of growing up was always Medusa. You guys know about Medusa. Well. I'm going to introduce you to someone who's sort of close to Medusa. Meet Medusa's sister, Sally. Oh, for goodness sake. Instead of having hair, she has a single lazy snake. If you happen to glance at Medusa by chance, you turn to solid rock. Sally's curse is even worse. She makes you stop and talk.
Now, I, being inspired by doing that book uh, about Greek and Roman monsters, I decided to try to make up some of my own combination creatures. And a few of them have appeared in my books. This is uh, a creature called an alicatergator pillar. <laughs> alicatergator pillar chews a leaf, shows his teeth. Alicatergator pillar sings a song, then he's gone. Alicatergator pillar, by and by, my oh my. Alabutter gator fly. Now that, that love of combining things that don't come that don't go together is another major thing that I love to play around with uh, in my books and in my poetry, um, and so it, it, it's gone outside of animals into other realms. And I'll give you a few examples of how that how that's worked. Anybody know what that might be? A vampire. <laughs> he only works night games. His signals are creepy. When managers argue, he makes them feel sleepy. He never appears in the photos we snap. A widow's peak peeks out from under his cap when he takes a nap in the dugout. His eyes bug out and he hisses like a frightened cat at the sight of a broken bat. How weird is that? Once, while waiting on deck, I saw him staring at the back of the catcher's neck. <laughs> well, since it's sort of closing in on Halloween in a, in a, a month or so, um, there's another combination creature that I, I like very much that appears in my book, Hallow Willoween. And has everybody heard of an Oompa Loompa, right? <laughs> Has everybody heard of the chupacabra? <laughs> Have you heard of the oompa chupa loompa cabra? <laughs> it roams the western plains. On moonless nights, it captures goats and gobbles up their brains. It lures its prey with chocolate bars, a local man explains. Horns and hooves and candy wrappers, little else remains. Now here's another combination object, the crystal bowling ball. Step right up, come one, come all. See the crystal bowling ball. It knows how all the pins will fall and all the frames of all the games on all the lanes in every town. Bowlers come from miles around. They run, they walk, they even crawl. They seek the crystal bowling ball. Cost a nickel. If it's okay, I'd like to go back and ask a, a few more questions. 
Would a happy toucan from the Yucatan become cantankerous up in Anchorage or the Yukon? Or for that matter, Tucson? Do you ever wonder whether schools of narwhal have the wherewithal to play tetherball together? Are lazy flies on the horizon the prize that spiders keep their eyes on? And no one likes a spider bite, but don't you think a spider might? Why do you think grown-ups like donuts so much? They rave about flavors and fillings and such. They praise all the glazes. They savor the dough. Donuts are tasty. We get it. We know. Sometimes I like to take something that's very traditional and try to create something new from it. Um, this is one of my, the most popular poems from my first book, and I, it's probably one of the, the poems I wrote most quickly. I didn't think about it, just wrote it down. I wanted to write something sort of holiday-themed, and it's called Funky Snowman. Funky Snowman loves to dance. You think he wouldn't have much chance without two legs or even pants. Does that stop Funky Snowman? No. Turn up the music with a disco beat. When you're in the groove, you don't need feet. Crowds come out and fill the street. Kick it, funky snowman. Has everyone heard of the gingerbread man? Well, this is the runaway waffle. <laughs> Susie nibbles waffle. Waffle runs away. Susie chases after waffle. Waffle likes to play. Susie never catches waffle. Waffle doesn't stop. Susie gets all tuckered out and drinks a bottle of pop. Another example of uh, taking an old nursery rhyme and trying to do something new with it is a poem that I, uh, is also in my first book, Polka Bats. And uh, you guys know what? What April showers bring? What do you think October showers bring? Delicate skeleton flowers. A ghostly sight on Halloween night. They softly glow for hours. I thought, uh, we have a few minutes. I thought maybe uh, if, you, if the, the kids would like to uh, suggest some combination animals, we'll do some. Um, Quick drawings, if you want to uh, throw out some names of animals, we'll, I'll do a quick drawing of a combination creature, and we'll try to maybe give it a name. Does anybody have any, any suggestions? A giraffe? A, a giraffe monkey, okay. What would that be called, a, gir a gerunky? Uh, a monk calf? That's, that's too hard to say. Is that a drunky? I'm not sure if it is. And anyone else? Did you say a crab? And one more. 
a moose and a, a moose and a crab. Okay, what would that what would that be called? <laughs> a cruise? A, a moob? A moob? Oh, I think I know the name. But uh, actually, that's also a crabus, I think, too. Maybe, maybe time for one more. Al alligator? Uh, alligator, koala, and one more? Alligator, koala, elephant. Uh, alawala, alawala elephant? Alawala elephant. Alawala elephant? Well, I've taken enough, uh, up enough of your time. Um, thank you so much for coming out. Um, I'm going to be signing uh, copies of my book, Boy Wonders, at 1.30 at tent number 10, if you want to come by and either answer some of the questions I've asked or give me some of your own questions or suggest some more animals to draw. Um, again, it was fantastic to be here. Um, thank you so much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.